Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning, church family. It's great to be with you this morning. Our uh, service flow is going to be a little bit different this morning. Uh, we're going to go right into the Word now, and then we're going to respond in, in worship and in candle lighting and Advent reading and uh, singing after the sermon. So if we haven't met, my name is DJ, one of the pastors here at PFC. It's great to have you with us this morning. We are continuing um, our Advent series, which we took a break from last week. And um, I'm going to ask for some grace this morning uh, and also ask to pray uh, together here at the outset because um, actually one of our elders, Todd Taylor, was scheduled to speak this morning. And uh, Todd is super sick. And uh, so could we just pause and pray, uh, pray for Todd? And then uh, I'm kind of sliding in last minute. And so let's just pray that the Holy Spirit just speaks uh, as we open his word together this morning. So let's uh, pray together for Todd and Jen. Lord, we thank you for uh, the elders that you've called, the deacons, the um, worship leaders, the children's ministry leaders, the greeters. Uh, you've just gifted this body with so many people who are willing to serve and serve for nothing, uh, serve for for uh, nothing except to glorify your name and to serve the body. And we're just so grateful for that. And today, Lord, we pray for our brother Todd as he's recovering from an illness and would just ask that in the name of Jesus that there would be healing, um, that the meds would work, uh, that he'd be able to recover his voice and be able to breathe clearly, and that you'd just encourage his heart today. Pray for Jen, their marriage, their home, and uh, bless them in this season. And as we open up your word, we continue to ask your spirit to speak. Amen. All right, let's start in Matthew chapter 1. Would you turn there with me? I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation, starting in verse 18. This is right after Matthew gives the genealogy of Jesus, starting from Abraham and moving all the way up to Mary through the line of David. Starting, I'll start in verse 17. It says, all those listed above in that genealogy include 14 generations from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the Babylonian exile, and 14 from the Babylonian exile to the Messiah. Matthew 1, verse 18, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her fiancé, was a good man and did not want to grace her public, disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus. Or the Aramaic Hebrew word there is Yeshua, that's Joshua, which means Yahweh saves, is Jesus' name. So you are to name him Jesus, Yeshua, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through the prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Yahweh saves. So you, um, as I think about this passage, one thing that to me is obvious when I try to put myself in the place of Joseph is a total lack of clarity. Let me explain for a second. I think Joseph's life up to this point was probably pretty simple. He is a Jewish man, uh, probably living in relative total obscurity, uh, on the lower end of the social economic stratus. 
He's a laborer. He's a craftsman. His life is really simple. His plan is this, to worship and fear God. He's a righteous man, to get married, to have a family, and to bless the next generation so that his children would also follow Yahweh. This is his plan in life. When all of the sudden, this woman that he's engaged to, this young girl, probably 14 years old, probably half his age, is pregnant. All of the sudden, his life gets a lot more complex and a lot more complicated. It's about to get way more complicated because when he's about to break it off, because he doesn't want to embarrass this young girl, he doesn't want to shame her, and so quietly he's going to break off their engagement and move on. He has this dream. He has this dream where an angel of the Lord appears to him, and the angel says, this was actually from the Holy Spirit, follow me. Even with that word from the angel, Joseph's life doesn't get any easier because now he's at the very center of God's redeeming work in all of human history, from relative obscurity to a main player in God's work of saving the entire world like that. He didn't ask for it. He wasn't looking for it. Maybe there were nights when he didn't want it. But it is what it is. Now he is the father, the adoptive father of Emmanuel, of God with us, God in the flesh. His life is now anything but simple, anything but clear. We don't know exactly what happens to Joseph. We know that he'll be driven to Egypt with his child, and they'll spend several years hiding as Herod seeks to kill and murder the Messiah. And then he'll come back and they'll live in a, in a remote place in uh, sort of like our equivalent of the Ozarks. They'll, they'll live in, in Nazareth, hide hidden away in the hills of northern Israel to stay obscure, stay hidden away, stay away from the places of power. And that's where Jesus will be raised. We don't know what happens to Joseph. He must have died at a relatively young age because the gospel accounts give nothing about him after Jesus uh, at that story in Luke where Jesus sneaks away to the temple when he's 12 years old, that's the last we hear about Joseph. When Jesus uh, launches his adult ministry at the age of 30, Joseph is gone from the story, presumably has died at this point. Joseph's life just gets turned totally upside down. And I think one thing that probably was lost forever was a sense of clarity. All right, look at, your num uh, look at your neighbor and say, clarity. Look at your other neighbor and say, I just wish things were clear. All right, if you, if you get in a prayer group, I want you to put your spiritual antennas up and listen. Okay, so <laughs> it was like during COVID uh, when everybody was on Zoom, it was like obligatory to pray thanking God for the technology of Zoom. <laughs> like every single prayer gathering on Zoom was like, God, thank you for this technology that we can meet together and pray. It was like a hundred meetings in a row. Someone prayed that prayer. Another prayer that is prayed almost in every single spiritual gathering, if you listen, is this. God, make this clear. If you start to listen, you'll notice that this is one of the primary prayers that we pray. God, would you just make this clear? Make your will clear. Make it clear where I'm supposed to go. Make it clear what I'm supposed to do. I was at a uh, prayer gathering uh, with a, a friend not from PFC. He's a business owner. He owns a business in the King of Prussia Mall. And he invited me and a group of other prayer, uh, prayer warriors to come and pray over his uh, new business. This is going back... A uh, little over a year ago. And so we went to this prayer meeting in this store. It was before the mall opened. We're in this store. It's all dark. We're quiet. The gates, you know, those gates they have that lock down the stores. It's closed. We're just in this. We're in this little store, and we're praying for this man who, who fears the Lord and seeks him. And a small group of us. And as we're praying, we're praying, I just start to notice that all of us are praying for clarity. We're, we're praying that it would be clear who he should hire, it would be clear how he should advertise. It should be clear what strategies he takes. And we're all praying clarity. And I just had this, this little nudge from the Holy Spirit. You know that feeling when the Holy Spirit's just like fluttering, just like a little bit, just like 
pressing you, like, hey, listen, listen. And so, like, I, I, I had just prayed for clarity for this man, which isn't a bad prayer, but I'm praying for clarity, and the Holy Spirit's nudging me, and so I, I, I listen, okay, what are you saying? And this is what I heard from the Lord. Uh, I sensed him saying to me, what if I don't want to give him clarity? What if I want to give him peace? And then I started to think about that, and I was like, wow. I can think of a hundred scriptures off the top of my head that are about Jesus wanting to give his people peace. I can't think of any scriptures off the top of my head about God wanting to give us precise clarity. So I began to chew on that and think about it. What does it mean? I, again, this isn't a statement about praying for clarity being bad. Pray for clarity. <laughs> By all means, pray for it. My sense, though, at least in my own life and when I search the scriptures and when I think about the lives of my friends, is that it's really rare that God gives us clarity. But in every moment, every single day, he desires to give us peace. In this Advent series, we're going through the fruits of the Spirit. And we're looking at Jesus as the embodiment of God, God in the flesh. And we're looking at his life, and we're looking at the fruits of the Spirit embodied by Jesus in his life and in the Christmas story. And then we're looking at those nine fruits of the Spirit, and we're saying, how do we live out these fruits of the Spirit in light of who Jesus is? Today, we're focused on Peace and patience. Peace and patience. And so the title of my teaching or this, this talk this morning is this, that patience and peace come before clarity. Patience and peace come before clarity. Just a quick uh, overview of where we are in this series since last week we took off uh, for Thanksgiving series. Uh, the core of the Christmas message is that God became a man while remaining fully God. The word became flesh. Jesus was fully God while taking on the fullness of human nature. All right, I want you to pay attention to this line. Jesus is, in fact, the only person who has ever been fully human. When we talk about human nature, we often use it as an insult or we use it as an excuse. Yeah, I messed up. That's just my humanity. But that's actually theologically false. That's not your humanity. That's your fallen flesh. In your humanity, the, the, what is the image of humanity? What is, who is the firstborn of creation? Who are we born in the likeness of? It's, it's Jesus himself. So Jesus is, in fact, the only person who has ever fully been human in the sense of not being blemished, not being twisted, not being broken. He is humanity as it's meant to be. He is God also. He is man, the firstborn of creation. He is the image that all of the humans are created from and are designed to grow and mature into. In his humanity, Jesus relates to us and knows our weaknesses and struggles. In his deity, Jesus teaches, redeems, atones, saves, and bridges the chasm between God and fallen humanity. This is, uh, I wrote this weeks ago and put it in our sermon document so that all of us could chew on this as we're thinking about the sermon. This is what I read this morning uh, when I woke up early and was just spending time with the Lord. This is from Karl Barth uh, in Church Dogmatics. He says this, the doubtful thing is not whether God is person, but whether we are. Can we find among us even one man whom we can call uh, this in the full and proper sense of the term? No. But God is real person, really free subject. And if it is true that this brings us up against his inconceivability, inconceivable, because we cannot think through this thought to a finish, it is also true that on hearing his word, we should not refuse to think this initial thought to see him as person precisely in his word. That was a lot of theological words. What he's saying is the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and Jesus is the only true human. And so when we are looking for a standard of what is humanity meant to be, there's only one place that we can look. We look at Jesus. This is Colossians 1. He is the image of the invisible God. During his incarnate life, Jesus exemplified the full range of the fruits of the Spirit. Jesus not only lived a life 
filled with love and joy and peace. He himself is the embodiment of love. He is joy. He is peace. He is patience. He is kindness. He is goodness. He is faithfulness. He is self under control. All other humans, us, we can exhibit these beautiful traits as a reflection of him and his indwelling spirit, but Jesus alone is the source point for the fruit. In other words, the moon can reflect the glory of the sun, but it cannot shine light on its own. It is only when the sun reflects off the moon that the moon has any light at all. That's the same for you and I. We can bear the fruits of the spirit, but only when the son of God is shining upon us and we reflect it. Because he is love. It can be said about me, wow, DJ is loving. I hope it cannot be said about me that I am love. It can be said about Jesus. He is love. This is what he is. We can be loving. He is love. We can exhibit joy. He is joy. And so on through all the fruits of the Spirit. Again, I read this this morning. It's so cool. God's word, this is from Karl Barth again. God's word means that God speaks. This implies its personal quality. God's word is not a thing to be described nor a term to be defined. It is neither a matter nor an idea. It is not a truth, not even in the very highest truth. It is the truth. God's word is the, Jesus, is the truth. As it is God's speaking person, it is not an objective reality. It is the objective reality. So to bear the name of Jesus, we are called Christians after all, is to be called to a life of spirit embodiment and Jesus fruit bearing. For us to truly live into, and not just listen to the Christmas story, we must join Jesus in bearing the fruit of God's spirit as a signpost of God's incarnate, saving, redeeming presence. This is the gift of God. It's the gift God offers to the world through us, his redeemed children. If you've been tracking with our, our series the last couple weeks, hopefully uh, you had a chance to listen to the teaching uh, on Vision Sunday where I talked about this, the second or third commandment, thou shalt not bear the name of the Lord in vain. You remember that conversation? And, and that word, uh, thou shalt not bear the name of the Lord in vain, we have often translated as a speech act. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain, but that is not what that word means. What that word means, nasa, is to physically lift up. And so what the second commandment is, is God says, you are my people, I have put my name upon you. Yahweh has stamped his name on you. Because Yahweh has stamped his name on you, you shall bear his name to the nations. How do the nations know that God is God? Through the way that the people represent him. How do the Gentiles, how do the people in Canaan know that God is who he says he is? By looking at the lives of the Israelites. And this is why he takes idolatry so seriously. I'm a jealous God, he says. Thou shalt not bear the name of the Lord falsely. How do you bear the name of God falsely? By coveting your neighbor's wife? That doesn't represent who God is. By stealing? That does not represent who God is. By dishonoring your parents? That does not represent who God is. And so all of the rest of the commandments are the way that we bear the name of the Lord falsely. So this series, when we're talking about the fruits of the Spirit, I just wanted to emphasize as we talk about peace, we talk about patience and love and joy, what we're talking about is looking at Jesus, who is God, who is Yahweh in the flesh, and saying, that's the standard. Now I'm looking at myself, and that is not the standard. And I look back at the standard, and I look at myself, and I say, I want to be like that. And so I live into that. And the more I know what that is, the more I look at him and see him as he really is, the more that I can live out his way in the world. You shall bear the name of Jesus. We are Christians. We bear his name just by being in relationship with him. How do your neighbors and friends, how do your family members know who God is? He's put his name on you. They know who God is by the way that you live out and the way that you proclaim and the way that you, the spirit of God lives in you. That's not to say you're the savior. He's the savior. But he is redeeming the world and he's doing it generation after generation through his word being proclaimed through his body and through his written word. All right. Let's talk about peace and patience before clarity. Who wishes, I, I, already talk, I already introduced this concept, uh, concept a little bit, but just raise your hand if you wish things were a little bit more clear in your life. Everybody's had that thought. I just wish things were a little bit more clear. Let's talk about the gift of patience and peace 
before clarity. We're going to look at two scriptures here for a few minutes. We're going to look at Galatians 5, which is where the fruits of the Spirit are, and we're going to look at Colossians 3. In these two passages, Paul has a negative list in each passage of stuff to avoid, and he has a positive list of things to step into. In Galatians, what's, what's the metaphor that he uses in Galatians 5? What's the metaphor for good things? Fruit. The, the metaphor is fruit. In Colossians, the metaphor is clothing. Anybody here, you don't have to raise your hand, ever have a nightmare where you show up at high school and you're naked? The, the, uh, <laughs> I did get a hand to raise. <laughs> the, um, the list in Colossians 3 is the metaphor is not fruit. The metaphor is clothing, that we put on this clothing in Christ and we take off the rags that are on us. And so let's look at these two lists, and I want to specifically highlight patience and peace as fruits of the Spirit or the clothing that we put on in Christ. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. So keep that in mind, because in Colossians 3, he says, the most important piece of clothing is love, which binds everything else together in unity. So he's saying the same thing here. The most important is love, which entires the, uh, the entire law. Love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out, or you'll be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, I love this phrase because it, I love it because it convicts me. Look at verse 19. What does he say about the acts of the flesh? What are they? They are what? Obvious. 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 The acts of the flesh are obvious. How are they obvious? How are they obvious when we have so much ambiguity and so much mystery in this world? So much pain, so much disagreement. How is it obvious? This is how it's obvious. When we look at Jesus and we look at him as the standard, and then we look back at ourselves, it is obvious that some of the stuff going on in here is not what's going on there. Amen? You'd be horrified if my mind were opened up to you and you saw all my thoughts. You would be horrified. And I would be equally horrified if your mind was open up to me and I saw all your thoughts. When we look at the standard, there is only one standard, and it is the person of Christ. And when we look at him and we think about him and we meditate on him and we chew on him and we think about his life and his birth and his, his teaching and his parables and we make that what our life is about, looking at him over and over again, and then we look back at ourselves, judgment starts in the house of God. It's not that we look in the world and we say, well, that's obviously not him. It's that we look here. You know the famous quote that evil runs through the heart of every man? Like evil runs through the heart of every person. It's not about me looking out there and saying, well, that's evil and that's evil. Although there are times where that's appropriate. It always starts in the house of God. In other words, it always starts with you. You look at the standard and then you look back at yourself and you say, I am not that. That is not what I am. I am broken, I am fallen, my self-righteousness is as rags before God. The acts of my flesh, let's personalize this, are obvious. Because when I look at Jesus, he had a whole bunch of women who were vulnerable and walking with him, and he never once took advantage of any of them. Sexual immorality, obviously a work of the flesh. When I look at Jesus and I see his life, I see impurity and debauch uh, debauchery have nothing to do with him. I look back at my life, and I look at him, and I say, that is the standard. Idolatry and witchcraft, using spiritual power for personal gain, would be a good way to think about witchcraft. So spiritual power for personal gain. I look at Jesus. He did not use his infinite spiritual power for any personal gain. He laid down everything and became a servant of all. Hatred, there's none of that in him. Discord, none of that. Jealousy, he just gave and gave and gave. 
fits of rage? No. Selfish ambition? <laughs> the king of the universe just becomes a servant of all? Dissensions? Factions? Envy? Drunkenness? Orgies? And the like? The works of the flesh are obvious when we look at Jesus as the standard. When we look at him over and over again. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. When we look at the standard, when we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see love. When we look at Jesus, what do we see? We see joy. Let's think about the Christmas story for a second. For God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That is the Christmas story. (laughs) Joy to the world. The Lord has come. That is joy. Peace. Peace on earth. And goodwill to men. We see all of the fruits of the Spirit just in the Christmas story. Just in Jesus showing up forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. This is how you crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Every day, looking at the standard. And every day, looking back at yourself. That is how you crucify the flesh. Every day, looking back at the standard. And every day, looking back at, at the self and saying, once again... Once again, that is not that. So God, in your infinite mercy and grace, make me more like that. May I become more like that today. And tomorrow, may, may I be a little bit more like that. Again, not to earn your love. Your love is unmerited and just poured out infinitely through the once and for all saving act of Jesus Christ. But as I walk out my sanctification, as I walk out my sonship, as I walk out what it means to follow Jesus, I'm looking at that again. I'm looking at you again. And I'm looking back and I'm saying, whew, a little more love, Jesus. A little more patience. A little more peace. If, if we would just spend our entire lives doing that with the first four fruits of the Spirit, Love, joy, peace, and patience. Can you imagine how our lives would be transformed if every day we were just looking at the standard, looking back, looking at the standard, looking back and saying, help me step towards that. Help me step towards that. Help me be a little bit more like that today. Our lives would be utterly transformed. In a year, we would be radically different than we are today. And a simple daily prayer, make me more like that. Let's look at the second list. Colossians 3, Paul says, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on the things above. Set your heart on the standard where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. In fact, not just your heart. Set your mind on the standard, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will appear with him in glory. All right, now is the list. In, in Galatians 5, the negative list was like, don't eat this stuff. Don't produce this nasty fruit. Here, it's take off these rags. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. When you look at Jesus, do you see sexual immorality? No. So put it to death. When you look at Jesus, do you see impurity? No. So put it to death. When you look at Jesus, do you see lust? No. So put it to death. Evil desires and greed? No. Put it to death. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. Jesus says to Nicodemus, the light is coming to the world, but men hated the light and loved the darkness, and so they hid from the light. Every time we look at the standard and say, make me a little bit more like that, we're stepping back into the light. You used to walk in these ways in life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you have taken off those old clothes with its practices and have put on... This new clothing, which is being renewed in the knowledge of the image of your creator. Same thought as Romans 12. We are transformed by the renewal of our mind as we look at Jesus over and over again. Verse 11. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. And here's the list that looks just like the fruit of the Spirit. Clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. You're bearing the name of Christ, so bear with one another. And forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord has forgiven you. How much has he forgiven you? Has he held back any forgiveness from you? Not a piece. And so you are to forgive without withholding anything in your forgiveness towards others. 
and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity. And then this is the key verse for the morning. Can we, can we read this out loud together? Colossians 3.15. Can you read it out loud with me? Here we go. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you are called to peace. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Now, I don't know about you, but when I hear the word rule, I think about king or queen. I think about sovereign. I think about uh, a ruler. That's not what this word means in this case because there's another meaning to the word rule. And this other meaning is what it means here. Um, And it is a judge making a ruling in a court case. And so a judge stands or, or, you know, has her gavel and is behind the podium and she's looking at the, the two people in the case and they present to her their defense or they present the accusations and she's listening to the evidence, she's considering the evidence and then when all has been collected and listened to, what does she do? She makes a ruling, she makes a judgment, a ruling. With that new understanding of what this word means, read this again, think about this. Let the peace of Christ rule like a judge in your hearts. Let the peace of Christ be the thing that decides. Let the peace of Christ be the thing that guides your hearts. Since as members of one body, you are called to peace. Life isn't so much a series of coming to forks in the road. Um, That's like easy. You come to a fork in the road and you're like, should I go left or right? I don't know. Big deal. I'll go right and if I'm wrong, I'll come back and I'll go left. Life is like an endless series of what's the highest uh, stage of rapids? You know, when you're whitewater rafting? Five. Life is just like endless stage five rapids. It's not about going right or left. It's like, if I go right, I could die. (laughs) If I go left, I'm going to capsize this boat. If I go straight, I'm going to puncture it. Like, that's what life is like. It's like every single moment we're just trying to calculate how to get through. And that's why we pray all the time, God, just give me clarity. Make it clear. Where am I supposed to go? Let the peace of Christ, as you navigate the endless rapids of life, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. There are so many situations in life where you will never receive clarity. You won't, and I won't. And you'll pray for it, and you'll beg God for it, and he won't give it to you. But what he will give you in Christ, I promise you, as sure as this is the word of God and we can trust it, is he, through Jesus Christ and the embodied spirit in your life, will give you peace even in the midst of of the endless rapids of your life. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. This is the Greek word, brabeo. That's a fun word. Everybody say brabeo. Brabeo, to be an umpire, to decide, to determine, to direct, control, or rule like a judge. So I'm a baseball fan. You can picture the Holy Spirit in your heart like an umpire standing over the catcher who's bent down ready to receive the pitch. And he's the one who calls balls or strikes. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Paul says almost the same thing in Philippians 4. Don't worry about anything. As you're rushing through the rapids and you're about to capsize over and over again, Paul's writing this from prison. He himself being capsized many times, literally. Don't worry about anything. Instead, talk to God about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he's done. Then you will experience what? God's peace, which exceeds anything you can understand. In other words, you will experience God's peace, which is a whole lot better than clarity. You see that? It's a whole lot better than clarity. Why? Because his peace will what? It will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. So the peace of Christ is seeking to do two things in you as you bear the fruit of peace. Seeking to do two things. What are they? It is seeking to rule and to guard your heart. Patience and peace. This is the gift I'd like to offer you this morning in Advent. 
that you would take the most difficult situation in your life and you would present it to the Lord and just ask for his peace as Christ rules in you. Let's pray together. And then we're going to respond in worship. Jesus, we thank you for your presence here. We thank you for your spirit. We pray that your peace would rule in our hearts today. We pray that we would be a people of patience and peace. And even when there's a lack of clarity in our lives, that as we navigate the rapids of this world, Lord, that it would be your peace, the fruit of your peace that dwells in us, guarding and guiding and ruling in our midst as a collective body and individually as people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.